I'll start by telling you a story about how someone's expectations may change. In 2013, I took the trip of a lifetime. I went to Italy. And it became a dream back in 1998. I was a junior in high school. And in the course of history with a wonderful teacher named Mr. Johnson, after we learned a little bit about the history of Italy, I fell in love with the idea of going. So it started as a joke asking Mr. Johnson, take a group of students to Italy. He was a young uh, teacher with young children and I couldn't understand why he was so reluctant to take a group of teenage high school students to a foreign la uh, land, but I certainly kept persisting. So one day Mr. Johnson said, Vidalis, get about 10 kids to confirm and I will consider being a chaperone. So I made it my um, goal to promote and recruit. And in time, I was able to change his mind. And I had about 15 kids confirmed to go to Italy. By the spring, early summer, the wonderful trip to Italy took place. And I know it to be a memorable, amazing experience because I ended up seeing the photos of that trip. Because in the end, I couldn't go. I had to change my priorities at some point and I needed to work. So that persistent, great expectation and idea I had was not the right timing. 15 years later, I'm now married with a seven-year-old daughter. We finally can make it. And months prior to this big trip that we're going to take to Italy on a strict budget, I would spend hours at night researching online, uh, trying to determine uh, hotel accommodations and what we were going to do for almost two weeks. And what helped me determine where to go and where to stay was primarily based on the reviews and the recommendations of people who have done the trip. So I'm telling you this so you realize and just keep that in mind, I made decisions based on strangers' recommendations on their word. I took their word for it. I expected them to have a solid recommendation and I trusted that. When someone tells you that they will take your word for it, it means that they're choosing to believe you based on trust. And there's something about what they're witnessing or how they're witnessing you express in, with confidence, whatever you claim to be true, that compels them to take your word for it. If you want to be taken seriously, keep your word. But before I get into that, I have to start with something more foundational. If you want to be taken seriously as a Christ follower, keep God's word. For a few weeks now, I have been uh, digging into the book of Acts, and I didn't go into all 28 chapters. But we were digging into certain areas that it would tell us enough about the endurance and the resilience and the difficulties that Paul and many persons endured as they were planting churches and extending the good news of the gospel. I did not expand on the fact that Paul almost drowned in a shipwreck as he was heading to yet another trial to Rome. I did not even mention to you how he was bitten by a snake and was thought that was going to die because of the fever and the poison, but once again got out of that. All throughout the entire narrative, not only of the book of Acts, but the entire Bible, it tells us clearly about God's word 
of trust, of endurance, of love, and faith. Because throughout all of those hurdles, we can read how God's voice, how Jesus said many times, be strong, be encouraged, do not be afraid, for I am with you. The biblical story is clear about the fact that life is not all a smooth sailing. And Paul expected God to be there no matter what. I do want to point out that the very last words in the book of Acts, chapter 28, verse 31, it talks about how Paul continues to preach God's kingdom and to teach about the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the last piece. Nothing too dramatic. Meaning open-ended. Then you turn the page, which, by the way, two years in Rome. And then Romans chapter 1. And it reads like this. The first few verses of Romans 1. I'm ready to preach the gospel to you in Rome. To you Romans. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is God's own power for salvation to all who have faith. The righteous person will live by faith. So we have that word, which is true. But then we, we also have other texts like Matthew chapter 7, where it reads, Ask and you will receive. Search and you shall find. And the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks, receives. Whoever seeks, finds, and to everyone who knocks the door is opened. Who among you will give your children a stone when they ask for bread? These verses do not mean that we are to position ourselves as a master, have a, a lamp, rub it, and expect Jesus to come out and grant us all of our desires, our wishes, and our needs. We are not to keep a scorecard on God. And based on life's experiences, have you ever felt like God is not actually there? That maybe he's not listening to you, or even worse, that he's allowing for the pain and the suffering to continue? So what exactly does it mean to have an expected kind of faith? And that's today's focus. What does it mean to have expectant faith? I want to explore it in a way that we choose to believe that God has no limits because God is above circumstances, limitations, and problems. But for me to be able to go from that starting point, I need to make the assumption that I believe that there's a God, that he is our creator, and I believe that in Jesus Christ there is salvation. So once I have that as my fundamental ground, then I can say, so I choose to trust knowing that God is, transcends, it's above and goes beyond our limitations. So I want you to think of all of life's limitations and everything under the sun, it's real, but it also has a cap. All of life's limitations have an expiration date. And we know that if we trust that Jesus Christ conquered sin, suffering, and death. The Bible tells us John chapter 16, verses, verse 33. This is when Jesus talks to the disciples as he's about to be arrested and crucified. And it reads, I've said these things to you so that you will have peace in me. In the world, you have distress, but be encouraged, I have conquered the world. 
Do you see there how, although I'm saying God is above circumstances, he's conquered in Jesus Christ, which tells me that God does stay involved. God came down from majestic place, down to our realm, got into it, permeated, and rose once again to the occasion and above it. So God is not only involved, but God is never indifferent. God is actually very in tuned with what is happening in our midst. The thing is that God often answers differently of what we believe should be happening. So we respond to pain because we are made of flesh and we have a heart. And it hurts. So there's anger, there's sorrow, there's despair, there's hopelessness, there's weariness. These are true feelings. And when your loved one hurts, I think we tend to hurt even more. Because we realize our limitation. But because of love, isn't it true that when I love the one who I'm hurting, no matter how ugly it's going to get, how messy it is, I don't turn my back on them. Because love feels, love hurts, love doesn't hide, love doesn't turn away, love steps in to help, love endures. And if I believe that God is love, then I'm gonna take it a step further. God feels. God hurts with us. I know that because Jesus suffered on that cross. And Jesus feels and walks with us through the pain. So that tells me that God endures. God does step in to help us. And God is true and God is just and good. Because God is love. And God does not lie. And God speaks truth. But it's in our nature to question God when it hurts. And isn't it true that we tend to question God much more when things are going bad than when things are going well? Of course, it's human nature. And it's human nature to expect good when we've been good and expect mercy when we haven't been good. We are created to pursue goodness and righteousness. Again, if I believe God is my creator and I'm created in his image, no wonder I have this drive to seek justice and what is right. So when our expectations are not met by God, how do we address that? Please know this. If God granted us every single need, every single time, within all of the parameters that I believe to be right and true, then our relationship with God is based on a transaction. And that transaction has a condition that as long as I gain whatever I need or wish, then I have a relationship with God. That means that our relationship is founded in my needs, in my parameters, and even in my own limitations. So look how so easily what it should be my desire to be Christ-like as a follower, so easily it can turn for me to become the center of it a self-God. So my question then would be, then who is sitting at the throne? Who's at the center of this dynamic if the foundation of it is a transactional based on my gain? So we know that's not it, right? That's not it. When we take that position to be at the center with so much condition around it, we're missing the mark. And missing the mark is another definition of sin or brokenness. 
and our relationship with God is not to be based on sin. God treats a brokenness and treats the sin, but our relationship with God is based on love. So the good news is, sin and suffering is not beyond the scope of God's ability of Christ healing. Because Jesus came to heal the sick, to forgive the sin, to make whole the broken, to conquer death, to become the way so that we have a moral compass and a way for salvation on this side of life and heaven. And then, even for the things that don't get done completely here, Jesus prepared a way for us in eternal life. But ultimately, the will of God does prevail. God's word transcends, goes beyond this limitation and on. Question, is Paul today in the presence of God? After all of the things that Paul suffered, almost drowned, jailed multiple times, tortured, incredible, incredible hardships, where is Paul today? He's at last resting, and he fulfilled his mission for his life accordingly. Where is the church today? Did the mission of the book of Acts, the ancient times, hundreds of years ago, is there a church today? Yes, you and I are making the church, and today, yes, we're scattered again a little bit in a certain or, or unique way. But the mission prevails. So do you see how there is room and space and confidence and reason to have an expectant kind of faith? To go ahead and ask and believe that you shall receive God's will. It may look different. You may not agree or like it. And it may be painful. But God's word prevails. So by keeping God's word... We may be shaped by it. And as long as we allow this truth to shape our lives as disciples in the making, then this word becomes the living word. And the Holy Spirit begins the work and continues the work, which tells me then that others will see in you the fruits of the Spirit. So if you want to keep your word. Start by keeping God's word. And one of the outcomes of that is the blessing that someone else will be inspired by you. When they are embarking in, in the life's course of a traveling unto the unknown, and I don't know what it's like, and I need to look for recommendations out there or reviews. I need to take your word for it that it's going to be okay. Your life's testimony may just give me the confidence to go ahead and do the same. It matters that your spouse, that your husband and your wife can, can believe your word. It matters not that we are being kept on the scorecard on one another, but it does matter to be able to be held accountable, that people can keep your word, that you inspire that. It's beautiful to know that our children can believe us and want to be like us. It's inspiring to see other people and even parents be inspired by their children. It's believed that Gandhi said once, I like your Christ, I just do not like our Christians. They are so unlike Christ. I understand that sounds quite offensive and quite judgy. And um, it even sounds like he and people that would think that way are keeping a scorecard. So without going to that extreme, isn't it true sometimes that we're missing the mark and that we're very quite conditional 
with God. So it's not about a scorecard, but it's about accountability. And it matters that we keep our word. And it matters that our faith is active. And it matters that our faith is um, it's shown in our actions. So what is it going to take to raise our sons and daughters to follow Jesus? What is it going to take to keep our marriages centered in Christ? What is it going to take to keep our word as a church that believes that we are together on a mission? I want to ask you first church, friends and family, to prayerfully start thinking. This is the most inopportune time for me to um, welcome you and invite you into a time of, I think, I, think, I think we have to make some kind of incredible difference in Coral Springs. I think we, we, we have to do something meaningful in the fall. And I know, and I've asked God, really, now we can't even gather. I think the Holy Spirit is calling us to embark in a relational discipleship. I think we have to grow in digging more into the word understanding the word so that we can keep our word. And I invite you to keep your heart open and soften. Work through those hard, very real feelings when you're hurt. Please remember that God's word ultimately prevails. The word is evidence of that. May your life be evidence of that. So I invite you to take, to receive communion. May this be the bread of life that you need and the cup of salvation, the nourishment of your soul that we need more than ever.